What's up, champs? And welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Burnett, and joining me as usual, Lewis Ezekiel. Lewis, my friend, how are you doing this fine, fine Thursday Thanksgiving evening? Oh, I'm feeling good, you know, stuffed to the brim with turkey and potatoes. I know that you are. Uh... <laughs> I'm laughing at you immediately on this, just like, yeah, I'm I'm pretty good. <laughs> like oh, you sound I'm good. I'm hanging so in there, full man. of turkey, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's really nice of Elon to step in for me on Tuesday. That was our Thanksgiving proper. Uh, my wife is working at the hospital tonight, uh, so no chance to have kind of that fancy dinner. But we did end up having kind of an early afternoon celebration uh, with some folks. So once again, I have stuffed myself to the brim, and I am ready to talk some crypto fantasy hockey as the turkey slowly puts me to sleep here. Oh, my God. Look at you. You're so – at least your pun game is fully awake. So that that's all that really matters. Uh, Lewis, we are on a break from fantasy hockey or the NHL. There are no games tonight in one is, I guess, the first night off since the season started because of the Thanksgiving Thursday. Uh, we have a super-packed Wednesday and Friday slate this week instead. Uh, because there are no games tonight, and it's really weird to be recording when there are not games on TV. That's a very unusual experience for you and I. But I think that it. Um, I think we wanted to take this opportunity to sort of open up the mailbag, get a get a few questions from listeners and patrons. And uh, because there aren't so many headlines today, because most teams aren't practicing and and no teams are playing, we thought this might be a good opportunity to reach out and ask some questions. So, Lewis, I'm going to hand the mic over to you to start. Why don't you read us our first question of the evening? All right. Well, our first one comes from Julian Paquette, uh, and it actually deals with the issue that you were talking about, which is the funky schedule for the week. It says, curious to know how you guys approach a day of pause like we got today. Uh, what will you be looking at while you prepare for the last three days of your matchups? Does the pause change in any way how you approach your matchups? Um, so tackling this question, you know, this is true for any week, but I think this week especially or any of these kind of weird weeks, I really make great use of the schedule planner. Uh, Elon has one at keepingcarlson.com slash tools. There's also one on frozen tools. I think it's really important to keep your streamers in mind for a week like this as kind of long or short term. So, for instance, uh, to secure a win last week, I turned a couple of bubble types, you know, bottom of my roster or top of the free agency list. Uh, so I had two slots that I was willing to stream this week. Uh, one, I had an empty D slot on busy night. So that was going to be my long term slot. And by long term, I just mean this is somebody I'm keeping all week long, barring injury. Uh, you know, who I'm going to have, you know, uh, someone when I'm listening to stream scheme and Dave says, you know, this guy has a great schedule this week. He's got four days. He's got some off days, whatever. So that's someone that I wanted to hold throughout the course of the week. I uh, grabbed Hampus Limholm, uh, obviously didn't hold on to that power play one spot, but has been really productive with his peripheral. So he's been a fine ad there. Uh, the other one I want to use to stream higher impact players, forwards and goalies, but because of those really busy nights, I knew I wouldn't be able to get people in specifically on those days. So I really want to use them to kind of get the best possible impact I can get, you know, not worrying about consistently getting this person in a lineup, but trying to get one or two games. Uh, so that's my short term slot. I want to burn my other three moves just in that one slot. And I think I'm going to do that by doing goalies. So I, uh, I grab Corpusalo for his start. Uh, earlier in the week, I'm going to try and hold him to see if I can get one more start here later in the week. But if he's not announced as a starter, I'll probably flip him for another goalie if I have a spot there uh, or else a forward or wherever I can fit him in. I think it bears mentioning here, though, that we are talking about the Cupful, the Keeping Carlson Ultimate Patron Fantasy League, which is a league where goaltenders are very rarely negative. So even if, you know, a Corpusalo has like kind of a meh night by his rate stats, his GAA, his save percentage, the win and just a, a handful of saves is enough to make it a, a positive adjustment to your roster. I would say that it's much more in categories leagues, you're going to be more careful in terms of streaming and goalies. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good point, and I appreciate you putting that in context. And yeah, the cup, the cupful, you know, you can have somebody who lets in four goals against, but still can earn you a nice handful of points. That's more than you know any forward is going to put together from peripherals alone. 
Yeah, and I think that, you know, to sort of look to the next step, therefore, if I if I were to translate your advice into another league, basically, I'm just saying, okay, if I'm not going to stream in a goalie, I'm probably just going to stick to forwards or defense if I'm looking for those peripheral stats. Obviously, you're looking category specific in category leagues. I totally agree, uh, Lewis. That's pretty much where my thought process is. I will say I was on the Apples and Genos podcast last weekend talking about my waiver wire strategy in general. And if I'm cruising in leagues, like if I'm in a categories league and I'm basically going to for sure make the playoffs because my team is strong enough and my start was good enough that I know I'll at least be able to to keep pace with the rest of the league, something like that. I'll only make ads for the long term in in leagues like that sometimes rather than a league like the Cupful, which is heavily competitive, where I'm looking to maximize ad drops each week to try and maximize my weekly points. I think this week, though, is a really interesting week to kind of look longer term because it's so hard to find value streaming in this schedule because we have the heavy Wednesday and Friday nights. So that's one way I do look at a week like this a little bit differently. I might grab someone who who won't fit in my lineup this week, but will fit four times next week, where I usually would be trying to look just for this week, just because, you know, sometimes you're looking at a waiver wire and it's just so for a for a matchup or a, an evening specific play. And it's just so uninspiring that you're like, yeah, I guess I'll just look ahead. And and I think that this week can be this week can be a good change of pace in terms of the way that you're streaming. You can zag while your opponents zig. Also though, Lewis, I think it bears mentioning I do really like this opportunity to just chill, right? Like fantasy hockey can be a super grind and when you're in hyper competitive leagues or you're hyper competitive yourself, it's also just nice to take some time to relax. Stre- not stress about your stupid matchups and enjoy a night away from the grind because it's a long season. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like uh, you'll be looking forward to the Olympic break when we get there. I mean, maybe I will. I don't. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll be drafting. We might be drafting uh, Olympics teams though, just to to sate that competitive urge. So who knows? We might we might lean the other direction. I mean, if you if you it, are you going to make me draft an <laughs> Olympic team? I feel like I'm being threatened a little bit right now. I don't know. We'll see where that goes. All right, uh, let's jump on to our second question from Adam K. He asks, sure. "I dropped Horvat in Kakupful. Did I make a Job Bluth sized mistake?" Yeah, I think that the Kakupful element of this is kind of the the important one, and I know that a lot of our listeners are obviously Kakupful players. I think though that there are you know the Kakupful is a fourteen team league. And I think it's different than a lot of other 14-team leagues in terms of players that I'd be willing to drop. Horvat can definitely be streamed out in a lot of leagues, in my opinion. Leagues with plus-minus categories, 10 or 12-team leagues, for sure, where you can find somebody who's 60, 65 points. Basically, any league that doesn't count face-off wins where he's a monster. There are definitely other 14-team leagues, though, that are shallow enough that you could probably get away with dropping him and keeping your eye close to him and re-adding him if and when he turns it around. But I do think it's pretty obvious when you look at the underlings that he will turn it around to a, a fairly fairly obvious degree. I mean, so he has 11 points in 20 games this season, but mainly it's just that he only has one goal in his last eight games. I kind of think that when when you look at those numbers, even if you just look at the shot numbers, you can see he's got 28 shots over the last eight games. He, If he was shooting at his career average pace over that span, he's got four goals instead of one. That puts his pace up to around 60 points, which is exactly where you drafted him. So I think he's cool enough that you can slide him out for someone who's performing and even if he does get scooped, it's not like it's going to cost you a, a fantasy championship or whatever. It might actually hurt you more just to hold him in your lineup while he's this cold and while the Canucks are so terrible. However, like I said at the beginning, I'm probably not streaming him out in the Cupful because you're playing with such strong competition that you're not going to see other Horvat-like players hit the waiver wire. So you probably just have to hold on in a league like the Cupful. Yeah, I, I agree with where you're coming from with his numbers. Looking a little deeper at them, he's actually shooting all right at even strength. He's actually shooting at a career high at even strength, but where he's really suffering is on the power play. He's got a career low shooting percent, and he's only participating in 22% of the goals that are scored while he's on the ice on the power play. So that's really grim. 
that's not what we should expect to see. He should have a couple more power play assists in there. Like you said, he should probably have a couple more goals in there too that I think would make him look more like a 60, 65 point guy than a 40 point pace guy. Um, so yeah, I think I'm with you. I, I think in the cookupful, I think probably this will be something that, uh, Adam may regret. But ultimately is not going to spend, you know, weeks and weeks despairing over. Um, you know, I think we will things start to normalize a little bit for him, uh, on the power play and that'll help even things out, even if they fall a little bit at even strength. I think I was a little more open to the idea of dropping him maybe than you were when I was doing my prep, although you, you made a very convincing point. You know, if you're looking at someone who you think maybe maxes out at 60 point pace, uh, on one hand and maybe a streaming slot on the other, where as we said, streaming in a goalie, even on a rough night can get you four to six fantasy points, which is like getting a goal or getting an assist in a couple shots. I could potentially see doing this without regret if every other slot is kind of booked up. I think you're absolutely right though, that someone is going to jump on him because of that potential upside. If he went to the waiver wire, Given my roster construction, and again, I don't know who Adam dropped him to get into his lineup. I don't know, you know, what method he was using to try to win his week that led to this decision. We don't have a ton of context. I think I put something like 11 or 21 on him. You know, I, for me, this would be about a third of my remaining fab. Uh, the way that we're using free agent auction this season, uh, not using it for every pickup, but only using it for players on the waiver wire means that its value is diluted somewhat. Um, since you don't need it so frequently. Uh, and I, you know, this is a pure shooting center who's shooting two and a half times a game and whose rebound prospects are on a few minutes of power play a night on a team that seems kind of dysfunctional. Uh, to me, I'm willing to spend some fab on it. I bet there is someone else in the league who is willing to spend a lot more. So I'm imagining that if I were in this cupful league, someone else would end up with Horvat other than me, uh, just because I don't love his prospects for rebounding so much that I think that it's going to be, um, you know, a, a sure thing to get back to above 60 point pace. You don't like So last year he finishes at a 57 point pace. You don't think that that's a more or less like fair expectation? I mean, I think that's okay, but, you know, given the way that the, the point structure works in this particular league, I think that streaming, you know, if that's the only spot you could have for a streaming slot, I could live with streaming in that slot instead of having Horvat. That makes a lot of sense to me, Lewis. We are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to answer a few more mailbag questions. You're listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back, champs. Lewis, we are continuing through the mailbag episode. We're about halfway through. Why don't you take uh, start us off on our next question? All right. So at Punk Hockey on Twitter asks, uh, do we buy into Grubauer's two good starts? I do. I think I'm a believer. At even strength, the Kraken allow the second fewest shots per game. They control 51% of shot attempts. They allow the second fewest high danger chances against per 60 minutes. And they're expected to score a 51% share of the goals. And yet, they actually have a 39% share of even strength goals scored, which is the second lowest in the league after Chicago. And I just don't see that continuing. I think that we are going to see some regression. You know, this was a team that was built to be defensively sound and then sort of work out the offense as they go. And what they've actually had so far is a defensively sound team with really poor goaltending. So either Grubauer is actually a terrible goalie who cannot play well, even on a good defensive team, or he's been unsustainably bad and is due for positive regression. And I think that the second is much more likely because we've seen him be successful in Colorado, which offered him similar protection. Like he was just a potential Vizina winner. Now, obviously they're offering is a lot more. Vizina a thing? Are we using Vizina? I I am merely stating a fact. Is it true or not that he was in No, the... no, no. You're misunderstanding me. I have never once heard it pronounced Vazina. Oh, oh, all right. Vaz Vazina? Is that where I should be going? My my I am just for the record, I'm leaving all of yeah, this. Yeah, no, way. leave it in. <laughs> Sorry. Vazina trophy. Uh and you know, we've seen, I've, you know, you've thrown me completely off kilter here, I, uh, I which I appreciate. Um, but yeah, like we've seen him do it before. And I'm not saying that the Seattle Kraken are the Colorado Avalanche. They obviously aren't. Um, you know, that it, there is something to be said about having an effective, powerful offense that can control shot share, uh, you know, and put a lot of pressure on the other team. But I think that he could certainly be doing better than he is. And I, I you know, 
I'm not saying that every start is going to be like these two good starts either, but there is some happy medium between the utter putrid effort that he's put forth so far and these two really nice starts. Somewhere in between there, I think, is the true Philip Grubauer. Well, but so when we look at unsustainable forwards, for an example, and it's like, okay, well, if you regress the shooting percentage to around the career average and you sort of smooth out the assist rate based on their IPP or their points percentage, points participation percentage, rather, meaning, you know, if a player is getting too lucky or too unlucky when they're on the ice and goals are going in for their team, are we, you can sort of but use some back of the napkin math to sort of say, okay, yeah, he's playing at a 40 point pace, but he should probably be around a 60 point pace. Sort of exactly like what we're talking with Horvat, whether or not he hits 50 or 60 or 55, whatever. But with Grubauer, we're talking about him being unsustainably low. I can get behind that, but I guess my question is then, is he just a little unsustainably low? Like, because right now he's an 890 goaltender on the season. So is he a 902 goaltender? Is that worth buying? Are we buying, are you buying him as a 910 goaltender? Like, do you think he's going to be average moving forward? What, to what extent are you buying in? Yeah, I think that he should be able to be average moving forward. So around a 910, right? I'm not sure what the season average is this year, but I think that was pretty close to what the season average was last year. I think if you are a decent goalie playing against a solid defensive team, you should be able to pull off that average. And, and, you know, obviously he hasn't been able to do that up to this point this season, but now we're starting to see at least in the last couple times through. And again, you know, we're only a quarter of the way through the crack and our, our, you know, get in there, uh, what do you call them? Get in their tentacles wet here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they are, are, you know, I think that, that we're going to see a little bit more, maybe a little bit faster of a, uh, there's some more marginal gelling that can be done on a team that everyone is new to than maybe a team that has been together and has a few pieces maybe. But, you know, we've seen the lines being shuffled all the time and they're starting to find some consistency now. I think this is a team where uh, stability and consistency is still being reached. And I think that'll help Grubauer overall as the season moves forward. Interesting. I took this question so differently. So I'm really happy to hear your assessment here and that you went a different route with it. Um, I sort of took it from the goalie agnostic perspective of just like, who knows what will happen next? You know, try looking at a, a data point or a, a scatter point graph, and it, we're just seeing all of these numbers, these random performances uh, plotted out. How do I know? How could I possibly begin to think that I could guess what the next uh, performance will be for, for a goalie like Grubauer? So, you know, thinking about the way that we sometimes use the term A-gab for all goalies are bad, obviously there is a voodoo to goalie analysis. There's no doubt. The way that we go into a season, expect it, the way that goalies shoot up or down the rankings is just unmatched by any other position. But I do kind of cringe when I hear that as like an analyst from an analyst like myself uh, when it comes to actual analysis, because in the end, we do need to have like a take or a strategy that we're imparting. And so I kind of took this from the way that I kind of wanted to talk about the way that I va evaluate goaltending and the way that I decide goalies that are worth taking a uh, chance on. And so when I'm looking at a goalie, I'm basically trying to ignore the name as much as I can. Obviously, ideally, I'm looking for solid results and opportunity to play a ton of games. If you can hit on both of those, you're golden, but obviously it's not that easy. Sometimes you're going to need to scrape the bottom of the waiver wire barrel for goaltending. And what that looks like for me is taking shots on guys who have workhorse opportunities on sound defensive teams and Grubauer does tick both of those boxes. Like you said, he has all the opportunity in the world, and his team is very good defensively. So to my brain, if I'm ignoring the name, there's no reason to think he can't be passable for stretches of this season. You'll note I'm not giving like a full-throated endorsement, especially following your, I think you're more uh, excited or more, I think you're a bit more bullish. And that's because goalies are still voodoo, right? But this type, of, this is the type of swing I'm likely to make if I see him on the waiver wire, because if you can get a workhorse, the ceiling is so high if things just turn around. And I do think that there is some sort of law of goalie thermodynamics that says that if goalies are voodoo and any goalie can blow us up, 
then necessarily also any goalie can randomly turn it around as well. So I'm not into Grubauer as a, oh, go buy this guy, spend real assets type of player. But in terms of taking a free shot on a guy who could have a workhorse workload, that's the sort of bet I am really into. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so we kind of took two different paths to sort of wind up in the same place, which I think is an interesting way to approach answering the question. And I hope you enjoy it at punk underscore hockey. Yeah, and shouts out punk underscore hockey. They're a, they're a fun chat on Twitter. Absolutely. Lewis, we have one more question to get to, and it comes from our pal Edward. Shouts out to Edward, part of the Timmy's gang on the Keeping Carlson Discord. Uh, Besser, Wheeler, and Reinhardt all dropped in my 14-team Cats League that includes hits and face-off wins. Is all hope lost, or can they rise again above streamer status this season? He also asked, should I drop Couturier for any of the three? Lewis, uh, let's let's go through the questions first, and then at the end, I kind of want to get into a ranking, if, you, if you're up for it. All right, so I took a look at these four folks, and you know, uh, just sort of looking at a few areas where I think they could stand to potentially improve, uh, I did come up with my ranking, and I'll tell you in just a second. Um, I, you know, all of these guys have controlled the majority of shots at even strength while they're on the ice. All of them are scoring below their expected goals for Wheeler is the lowest, uh, with Couture and Reinhardt almost even between expected and actu- actual. Um, Wheeler really, based on what I saw, Wheeler really looked like he is due for a significant turnaround. The only thing that has me concerned is Wheeler is 35. You know, he's coming back from COVID. You know, is this truly a guy who should have five more goals while he's on the ice than he's had? But on the other hand, he does have the most exciting line mates. Um, but I will tell you, I put Couturier at the top of my list because I feel like he is the most indispensable player to his team. He plays in all situations. You know, he is, you know, pretty good for those faceoffs that uh, are counted here in this league. Um, you know, this is a guy who I think that the Flyers are know that they have to rely on. And I think that is not true of the other three players on this list. And so, you know, all of the analytics aside, what my brain tells me is that the guy who is an essential cornerstone to his team is the one that you should hang on to because he's always going to have a solid opportunity. So Couture is at the top of my list for that reason. I put Wheeler next um, because he does have the more exciting teammates if he can hold them. And because it seems like he is underperforming maybe the most compared to the other folks that we see on the list. Um, and then Reinhardt and Besser, I just worry that they are potentially spare pieces on their teams. You know, they are teams that have really effective players who can or at least should be able to carry play. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty of talent up there in that top six. And so I look at players like Reinhardt and Besser as maybe, you know, the kind of guys who are more likely to be shuffled down the lineup. And we've seen both of them really have some lineup instability over the course of the season so far. I like Reinhardt better because the, you know, Florida, despite him maybe not getting all of the chances that maybe people think that he deserves, uh, and not getting the minutes that he was seeing in Buffalo. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a functional team and, and we have some serious dysfunction, I think in, uh, in Vancouver that has me a little bit more worried about a player like Besser. So my final list, Couturier at the top, then Wheeler, then Reinhardt, then Besser. And I definitely think that Couturier and Wheeler uh, have the potential to be more than streamers, despite the fact that I am the person that you and Elon so carefully tiptoed around naming as the one who dropped Wheeler uh, in our shared league oh, during I didn't the last even, I didn't episode, even know which you. I appreciate. <laughs> I didn't even, that, that was not a, I wasn't trying to spare your feelings. I just didn't catch that. Uh, I just thought it was very funny. I was listening to it and I was like, oh, yep, yep, they're talking about me. <laughs> so, Who is yeah, that I, idiot I think, from our <laughs> dumb. So, yeah, I think uh, Katuri and Wheeler certainly are more than streamers or have the potential to be more than streamers, assuming Wheeler can start to, you know, find that comeback. Uh, Reinhardt and Besser, I'm not as, as bullish on as, as you described it before, but um, I do think, you know, they have that potential there, but I do have them lower on the list. Yeah, to me, Couturier by a mile of this group. And I actually think it's funny you mentioned how he's guaranteed to get great deployment because like on Monday night or Tuesday night, rather, he started on the second power play for Philadelphia and then Brassard got injured and he got pushed up. And so even though that I think that there will be moments where you're annoyed by Couturier and he is a bit frustrating, he's not an 80 point, you know, every game you're getting a great score out of him type of superstar in fantasy 
he is a very safe play, and I would be very surprised to see him down in the dregs with with players this cold a few weeks from now. Uh, so th- to me, Couturier by a mile. Uh, next, I, I agree with you again on Wheeler versus Reinhardt. I actually had Reinhardt at the bottom, which is kind of funny because he is on that top power play unit with Barkov out. And if he gets hot, I do think he has the highest ceiling of the three, maybe even the four. I think he could be a point per game guy if he gets going in Florida. It just doesn't look like that's happening. Um, but so for now, I do have him at the bottom of the four just because he feels the coolest to me. And I've yet to see him show anything on his team. I have Wheeler over Besser, basically because his team is less depressing. And like you said, the lineup is solid. I don't really see him shifting down the lineup just because he's never been outside of the top six in his many years. And despite his age, I just don't see it happening. So as I said on the last week's episode or on the Tuesday episode, I do see a bit of a bounce back for Wheeler. Uh, Besser is a player who I just I he's so streaky that I, I could see it being way too long before you end up wanting to get back on the Besser train. So I guess we're pretty much identical here, except for I have Reinhardt below Besser just because I, I want to see a little bit more from him in Florida. Awesome. Hey, that was a lot of fun. We got to do a little bit of an atypical show for us here since we had the day off. I really enjoyed it. I think uh, I think you got a kick out of it too. <laughs> Shall we wrap things up here? Excellent. Lewis, thanks so much for hanging out with me. And I do want to give a special shout out to Elon at the end of this medium to long shift, because I did not give Elon a chance to say goodbye. And he was he he wasn't loving it. So Elon, uh, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Lewis, thank you for joining me. And I appreciate uh, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving with the fam. Yeah, I'm going to be asleep in 20 minutes, I think. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks, everybody, so much for joining us. Please be sure to give us a follow at ShortShiftKK, as well as Brian and Elon at Keeping Carlson, and Dave Benton of the Stream Scheme at NHL Stream Scheme. You can also follow the suite of uh, Game Day Lines, Game Day News, and Game Day Goalies on Twitter as well. Uh, Visit the great sites we research our episodes with at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, Natural Stat Trick, and Cuckupful.com. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach, And until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short.